6. And just in the past, in Exodus 5, Moses had his first counter with Pharaoh. And he told him that I am has said, let my people go that they may go worship me. You know, God said that he is not I was. He's not I will be. He's not I'm going to be later, but I'm not right now. He says, I am. God is right now. Can you shut the door? Thank you. He says, I am. And so we're thankful that we have a God that always is. He's never changing. And so Pharaoh considered himself to be a God. Pharaoh thought he was the God around here. He says, I'm the God in these parts, not you. And so when he heard about letting the people go, he added more workload to the Israelites, made it harder for them. He added to their daily quota. Because he figured if they got time to go worship God out in the desert, then they must be getting lazy. If they got time to sit back and dream about going to see this God, then they, they're just lazy. And so what happened? The Israelite people got mad at Moses. Well, now we got to work harder because you went to him and said, let us go. But it wasn't Moses that ordered the heavy workload. Pharaoh did it. And so what really got me about Exodus 5, before we jump into 6, is the Israelites had been sent a deliverer by God, Moses, to take them out of bondage. And so when the workload got worse, who did they run to? They ran to Pharaoh. They didn't run to God. They ran to Pharaoh. The false God that made everything worse. They ran to that. You know, when you're under oppression, and we are in this world, people don't like us for our faith. They don't like us because we believe in Jesus. We're under oppression. And you've been sent a deliverer who is going to take us out of here. Who's that deliverer? That's Jesus Christ. He's going to take us out of here. So when the workload gets heavier here on earth, why would we be so foolish to run to the false God that made us the source, that brought the source of our oppression in the first place? Don't run to money. Don't run to drugs. Don't run to alcohol. Don't run to your 401k. Don't run to government. Don't run to yourself. Don't run to Pharaoh. Don't run to the false God that probably propagated your problems in the first place. Run to the Lord. That's what the Israelites should have done. But Moses did not run to Pharaoh. He took it to the Lord. When they got mad at him, hey, our workload's worse. He took it to the Lord. To change towards a godly life, you're going to have to, uh, you're gonna have to change your, your stance and go to the Lord. You know what? People are going to get mad at you for it, just like the Israelites did to Moses. They got mad at him. People are going to get mad at you. But take it to the Lord every time, <coughs> as Moses did in Exodus 5 and 22, which was the very end of Exodus 5. Um, I want to show you real quick. It says, so Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to his people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. That was a pretty sharp thing to say to God because he hadn't delivered the people yet. Things got worse, but God is about to turn the table real quick. And so we are in Exodus 6. Remember, always go to God. Exodus 6, I kind of thought I'd title it, I have remembered my covenant. And that's very important for us. God remembers his promises. And that's a good thing. Exodus 6 and 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of this land, out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. Big point there. I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, <coughs> the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I... <coughs> Sorry, y'all. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians kept, keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. I have remembered my covenant. You know, Moses had just returned to the Lord to ask him why he has brought trouble upon the people. The people are now worse. Why did you do this? Pharaoh had just increased the workload on the Israelites right after Moses told him that the Lord said, let my people go. Let them go. Remember, there were more Israelites in Egypt than there were Egyptians. And the, the Pharaoh before, he didn't like that. He wanted more Egyptians around than Israelites. But this Pharaoh, Pharaoh now, he's like, hey, let's just use them for a workforce. They're going to stay. They're doing work for us, right? 
He didn't want them to let them go. What did God say was going to happen? He said, Pharaoh himself is going to drive them out by the time I get done with him. <laughs> God's strong, man. You don't want God to take you out to the woodshed, do you? Um, so he said, so Moses returns back to the Lord to cry out for help. And that was a big part of the sermon last week. You know, we got to take it to, to God. Don't take it to your false God. Don't take it to your Pharaoh, right? <clears throat> we have been sent a deliverer. His name's Jesus. Times get harder. Why do you go to your Pharaoh? We got to run to God. Now, Pharaoh adamantly refused to let Israel go. He's trying to use them. And God has a way of getting things done in a way that we can't. That's, that's the main thing. That's the main thing that turned me. When I thought I was king of my own universe, God showed me, uh-uh, because you got a lot of problems you can't take care of by yourself. And God took care of it. And he, he, he took care of the situation for me. God is capable and where I'm not. God is rearranging things here now in such a way to make stubborn Pharaoh not only want them to leave, but to drive them out himself. Now, when you look at that impossible problem that stands in your way, that just simply refuses to get out of your way, we all have one. Oh, not you, Ray, you're the pastor. Are you kidding me? We all got them. You got those problems that stand in your way. As long as you try to work on it yourself, it's always going to be in your way. You take it to the Lord. Not only will that problem get out of your way, but God can make it to where it will even help push you along your path for you. Israel's biggest problem is Pharaoh. He's about to send them off himself, okay? That was their biggest hurdle. Never look at a problem in your life and say, God, you can't. Never do that. God can. And when God promises, guess what? He will. He will. God made a covenant with Israel, a promise to take them to the land that he will give them. And so God reminds Moses that he has remembered that promise that he made to them. He says, I remember the promise I made to them. God has heard their groaning from under Egyptian bondage. <coughs> so he's telling Moses, I've made a promise to fulfill that I made to them. So watch what I'm about to do to deliver them out. Now, friends, God has made a promise to us. Likewise. He's made a promise to us that if anyone will repent, that means turn around from what they used to do and believe in the gospel, this, the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, then he will take us to a place that he has prepared to us for us, much like he's offered for Israel. And when God makes a promise, he has to fulfill it. He has to. I've heard people say there's nothing that God can't do. That's wrong. There are things that God cannot do. God cannot break a promise. That's something God can't do. And I take comfort in that. He can't break a promise. Once he makes a promise, by his very nature, he is bound to it, and he has to fulfill it. <clears throat> so God is telling Moses, he says, I made a covenant, a promise, with Israel, and I will make it happen. How comforting it is, it is to know that this is the same God that we serve. The same God here, the same God that says in Romans 10, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth, <coughs> that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved. People better start shaking their heads, no. It doesn't say that. If you, if you do that, you will be saved. This is God making a promise and he has to fulfill it, Right? will be saved. Not might be, not probably, not 99.9%. .9%. If you confess Jesus as Lord, meaning that He is your new boss and believe God will raise Him from the dead, you will be saved. There's a lot of beliefs out there. You're not really sure if you really get to go to eternal life or not. They, just, they don't really know. We hope so. I hope it's in my favor. And the Word of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, He says, you do this, you will be saved. I couldn't go to sleep at night not knowing if I was really saved or not through Jesus Christ. I'm thankful of that. You can take that to the bank because once God makes a promise, he can and he will make it happen. And that's guaranteed. How nice. Some people go wondering, they don't know. Uh, well, they wonder if they'll be saved or not. Well, you got to see how God takes his promises very seriously. So when you read about this with God promising to Israel, 
You're, you're learning to understand the God that we serve and that when he makes a promise to you, he'll do the same with you, right? That's what's nice about this story. He takes his promises seriously. God said it, then you know you can trust it. I'm thankful God means what he says. He means what he says. So look at verse 4. <coughs> Try not to cough on the mic, y'all. Look at verse 4. The covenant God made was to give Israel the land of Canaan. Israelites did not live there. They did not live there. Canaanites lived there. So the idea here is that Israel is supposed to just walk into a land where other people live and just take it. We're here now. It's ours. And that sounds, if that sounds unfair, realize, ultimately, the land is God's. He made it. And he's entitled to give it to whoever he wants to. And that's what he decided to do. You know, people today, they're still saying today that that land does not belong to Israel. It does belong to Israel. I'm not looking at it politically. Well, Ray, you got to look at it politically. No, I'm looking at it from the Word of God. That's their land. God gave it to them. God who owns it gave it. Again, remember back uh, to the, the part of, uh, I brought up Noah's son, um, Ham, had walked into the tent when Noah was drunk and committed a dishonor to his father Noah. And so um, <coughs> Noah pronounced a curse on him. And it went through Ham, it went through all of Ham's descendants. And Ham's descendants are the Canaanites. He says, you're going to the land of Canaan. Sam's, th th that's Sam. I was just looking at you, Sam, sorry. Sam's... <laughs> Turn around, turn around, start over, reboot, refresh. Okay. <coughs> Get off the hook, Sam. Ham's descendants are the Canaanites. And so when Israel comes marching into Canaan, the Canaanites are going to be under them because of that curse. Way back in Noah's time, he said they will be under you to Noah's other son. So that's why when they come into Israel, they're just able to take it because that curse was there, Right? Israel is going to take that land. Let me, now, let me modernize the issue real quick. Our government, our government, this great United States of America, and I'm very patriotic. You'll see we not only have the Israeli flag, we have the American flag. God bless America. I'm American through and through. But our government has been trying to carve up Israel and give it away to a people that God never gave it to. I love God more than the nation, okay? I have to. And it's wrong for our country to try to do this. One of the presidential runners recently said that Israel is going to... I'm not trying to tell you who to vote for. I'm just saying. One of the presidential runners recently said Israel is going to have to give up some stuff in order to make peace. That's what he said. No. No, Israel does not. Nobody ever come over here and carved Texas off the map and said we have to give it back to Mexico. Right now, Israel, Israel's borders are not near as big as what God said he had given to them. If you want to know how big Israel's supposed to be, look it up in the Bible. He says, I'll give you all the way from here, all the way to there, all the way to there, all the way down to there. And Israel ain't near that right now. Israel ain't given nothing up. Israel is going to get bigger. You watch. It seems impossible, right? Well, how's that ever going to go down? There's too much fighting over there. They'll, they'll never get any bigger. Hey, 1967, Israel went and reclaimed Jerusalem back. That was pretty big right there. You just watch. Seems impossible that they could grow. Well, okay, impossible? Yeah, right. We're talking about God here. Just like God said of Pharaoh who stood in their way, God is going to make him the very guy that drives them out. God can change things. He can change your life. Again, that impossible thing you're contending with, there's no way this can change. <laughs> you just got to get your faith right, man. He will, and he can. God is going to make him be the guy to drive him out. You watch what goes down with Israel in the news. As the, all the nations, including the United States of America, push on Israel to give up more, give up more, give up more, give up more, God is going to turn it all around, and one day Messiah Jesus is going to sit on his throne in Israel on Mount, in Mount Zion on top of that hill. That's where he's going to come back and reign. Right there. Nobody's going to cut that out. It's going to happen. We can't, but God can. Keep your eyes on Israel. Watch. Remember I said God's going to demonstrate himself to the world by all the stuff going on? This is how he's doing it. Just keep an eye on Israel. <clears throat> God is demonstrating himself on a global scale. So God reminds Moses that he is going to fulfill his covenant with them. 
And before we read on, I want you to take notice how many times God says, I will, to Moses. As we read what God's going to say he's going to do. Count how many times as we read. How many times does God say, I will? Exodus 6 and 6. Therefore, <clears throat> therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I will give it to you as heritage. I am the Lord. How many times did he say I will? Seven. Seven times. Seven, yes, seven times. In the Bible and in Jewish thinking of that day, seven is a number of completeness. Complete. Completeness. God completely created everything seven days. And he rested. It's, it's done. It's completed. Seven days. There's a thing there. Mary Magdalene was delivered of seven demons. That means she was completely delivered. She was complete, completely healed. God told Joshua, march around Jericho for seven days and for seven priests to blow seven trumpets outside the city walls. In the book of Revelation, the number seven is used there more than 50 times in various ways. Go look it up. There are seven letters to seven churches in Asia, seven spirits before God's throne, seven golden lampstands, seven stars in Christ's right hand, seven seals of God's judgment, Seven angels with seven trumpets, etc. The seven churches represent the completeness of the body of Christ. Seven seals on the scroll, scroll represent the fullness of God's punishment of a sinful earth. And so on, and so on. Seven. Complete. God is a complete God. He didn't save me part way. Now, Ray, you do the rest. <laughs> I'll mess it up. <coughs> I messed it up to begin with. I'm a sinner. We have served a complete God. Hey, I'm trying to tell you, take comfort in that. When you leave here, all those problems, all those impossible things, I don't know how I'm going to do it. We serve a God of completeness. He'll deal with it if you make him your Lord. If you let him be the boss, right? This is awesome. It's going to get done. God said seven times, I will, to Israel. Seven times. God will completely and totally bring Israel out rescue Israel, redeem Israel, will take Israel as his own people. He will be Israel's God. He will bring Israel into the promised land and he will give it to Israel as a heritage. So how can he do all of this? Because just as he says in verse 8, I am the Lord. I love it. I'm excited. I just am. <laughs> For any of you, who continue to live your life without the Lord as your master, how much longer are you going to continue to wear yourself out? Oh, this is where I'm not supposed to look at anybody. How long are you going to live your way until you wear yourself out? There, I didn't look at nobody. <laughs> Why do you let Satan steal your peace and your joy? Why do you persist in operating in such a manner that damages yourself and other people around you when God Almighty takes care of you offers to take care of you just like this, completely, right? Stop living your way. Cut it out with the iniquity. Iniquity means my way. I run my life on my own terms. Hey, if you don't know God and you don't pursue him in his word, how can you know who he is? You got to do what he says. Find out who he is. But if you say like, I got to do things my way, that sin that gets you in a mess, you've got to let it go, repent of it, and turn around from it, and let God. Well, Ray, just because I don't repent doesn't mean I can't. You can't get to Dallas unless you leave Houston. Right. You have to leave here to get there. You want to get to God, you've got to let go of that old life. That's the way it works. This is word says it. The Lord does not do a job halfway. We serve a God of completeness. So if you let go and let Him, that's making Him Lord. That's what Lord means, the boss. 
If you're trying to run your life your way, you're your own Lord. You're your own boss. You have to let Jesus be Lord. Notice in verse 6, he says to Israel, <coughs> notice in verse 6, he says to Israel, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. What an outstretched arm means is that God's power would be evident. Everybody's going to see it. So I want to tell you, I don't care how sinful you've been in your past. I don't care how messed up you might have been or how messed up you might still be. I messed up a little bit. <laughs> the pastor, no way. Yes. But I walk in repentance. I don't care how messed up you've been. If you will repent of your sins and completely turn your life over to Jesus Christ, make Him Lord, and He's the boss now, it means you operate in the way that He says to do instead of the way you want to do. If you do that completely and fully, then He can and He will completely and totally deliver you from the oppression of sin and give you eternal life and complete and total freedom from the penalty of sin. And he will do it with an outstretched arm. Meaning, when he saves you for real, then there will be evidence of God's great power in your life. Evidence. Things will start happening that you never thought could happen. Everybody's going to see it. And they're going to go, there's no way you could have pulled that off. How's this happening? And then they'll get curious. And that's your chance to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. His power will be evident. You'll see things fixed, relationships mended, old grudges turned into friendships, broken marriages turned into love, healing and rec reconciliation. There is power, not just power, there is evident power in the name of Jesus. Then stop, if you haven't been experiencing this like I'm saying, then stop kidding yourself thinking you're saved you need to meet the real Jesus that I'm talking about here. This is the real God. He can fix things. Don't worship the God you created in your mind who only fixes the little small pieces of your life, leaving you with the majority of it still in a big old fat mess. I've seen people with giant problems and they go, oh, the Lord's really been working in my life. And they don't really sound confident when they say that. Man, if you'd really give it to him, oh, he'll take care of every bit of it. He didn't bring only a few of the people out of Israel. He brought them all. God of, God of completeness. Friends, the God of Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, our Lord and Jesus Christ is a God of, underline it, completeness. He does it all. I didn't earn part of my salvation. Jesus Christ did every bit of it. Once you make Jesus your Lord... He makes you completely and totally new. And if you have not experienced this big of a transformation yet, then man, what are you waiting for? God's too big. He's too cool. He's doing cool stuff in my life. And I see people, yeah, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. Yeah, I know, I know. He's working. He's working. But why do you look like that? You should be excited, man. <laughs> he turned my life way around, not just pieces so God of completeness. You don't have to stay where you are. Let the Lord Jesus pull you out of where you are. He did it for the Israelites. He can do it for you too. But for him to do this, then what you've got to do, for, to let him work a complete work in, in you, you've got to completely, 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 complete. Do I have to say it seven times? You have to completely turn your life over to him. Completely. Did I say five? Completely, completely. There, that's seven, I think. <laughs> completely give your life to him. Don't worry that he might not be able to pull it off. Some people do that. Yeah, I trust in God, but they hang on to that sin. Well, I don't know if he can totally do it, so they just kind of hang on. Well, that's you showing he can't. You believe that he can't. He can. You've been following a false god. If you hang on to your old life, you've been following a false god. If you run to your money and your stuff and your things instead of God, you're following a false God. A Pharaoh who can do a little bit of good but does not have the power to completely change and heal your life. If you don't have complete peace and complete joy in your life, you have to let go completely and completely trust the Lord. You do that, He will make you completely new. He's a God of completeness. That's the real Jesus. That's the real Jesus. 
There's a fake Jesus out there that people serve that are trying to make you believe that you can do anything you want. Just say, Jesus is Lord and keep living your life how you want to because God just wants you to be happy so you have the right to do whatever you want with your life your way. That's not how it works. Jesus is going to tell many people, according to Matthew 7, depart from me, you who had to do things your own way. You don't want to hear that. God did not tell Moses, well, I'll take some of y'all out, but I don't have the ability to take you all. If the God you serve have, has only delivered small little pieces of your life, but the majority of it is still in bondage, and it looks like it won't end anytime soon, then you're still serving Pharaoh. You're still serving another false God. And he's going to keep you stuck in your bondage. He's going to keep you there. The real God of Israel will deliver you out. He's not going to fix parts of it and leave other parts in a mess. I want to show you in 2 Corinthians 5.17... <laughs> <clears throat> Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All. We talked about this the other night. All means all. Doesn't mean some of it. means all of it. All things. And so again, if there's still bondage in your life, you need the real Jesus. You've been deceived into believing in a false God who doesn't deliver all the way. Oh, but Ray, I know I'm saved just because I'm still involved with the Bible says all things. Well, yeah, Ray, I know, but just because the Bible says all things. All of it. All of it. God said, I will take Israel out of Egypt. Let God take you out of your old life, your old sinful life. Don't settle for a partial life or partial peace, partial forgiveness or partial freedom. God is complete in delivering us. And so what, to really motivate Moses to encourage Israel, God burned it into Moses' understanding that he will make these things happen. In Exodus 6 and 9, So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of anguish and spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses, spoke, <clears throat> and Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. And so Moses tells the people again, but they wouldn't listen to him because of their oppression, because of their heavier burdens, right? What's tragic here is they forgot about their first response to Moses and Aaron back in chapter 4. If you remember chapter 4, where when he says, God's going to take you out of here, it says they bowed their heads and they worshipped. Oh, yes, and they worshipped God. But now they're like, no, they're not listening. How quick we are to turn, you know? How quick we are to forget the promises of God and the victory that he offers us. But again, God told Moses to go to Pharaoh, tell him to let the people go. Tell him, I said, let them go. But Moses hesitated because of how the people were. He said, I speak with uncircumcised lips, meaning unclean, incapable speech. He's basically saying, God, I can't talk. That's why they don't listen to me, because I don't know how to talk. Moses is starting to get down on himself for the very same thing that he told God that would disqualify him from being Israel's leader. I can't talk at the burning bush. Moses, lead your people. I, I can't talk. Why me? Moses wondered, how could he persuade Pharaoh if his own people weren't going to listen to him? Now, it's kind of like Moses saying, God, now look, I told you at the burning bush that I can't talk. Now look, nobody's listening to me. Not even Pharaoh, not even the people of Israel. Now, the last time Moses went into that, that kind of reasoning for his doubting, God brought up Aaron. Remember? And so again, God brings up Aaron to encourage Moses in his time of weakness. In verse 13, the Lord spoke to Aaron and Moses, giving a command for Israel and Pharaoh to bring Israel out of Egypt. He must have thought that his lack of success with the people was caused by his speaking ability. I, I, I can't talk. That's why it's not happening. 
And so this objection was answered by the Lord's command, this time to both Moses and Aaron to lead the people out of Egypt. Exodus 6 and 14. These are the, okay, God help me on this one. Shoo doggy. These are the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, where Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. And the sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jashan, Zohar, and Shal, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the families, these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 137. The sons of Gershon were Libni and Shemi, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. And the years of the life of Kohath were 133. The sons of Merari were Mali and Mushi. <laughs> These are the families of Levi, according to their generations. Now Amram took for himself, oh goodness, Joshebed, his father's sister, his wife, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the years of the life of Amram were 137. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. And the sons of Uziel were Mishael, Elzaphan, and Zithri. Aaron took to himself Elisheba, daughter of Amenadab, sister of Nashon, Nashon, his wife, and she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. And the sons of Korah were Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took for himself one of the daughters of Putiel as wife, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's houses of the Levites, according to their families. These are the same Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their armies. These are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring out the children of Israel from Egypt. These are the same Moses and Aaron. Oh, thank God for that. Whew, that was tough. You know, when we have a Bible, <laughs> when we have Bible study, and I say, all right, somebody read the next set, and it's a bunch of names, and then they get to read, and they're like, you can see the look on their face. Why did I jump in? <laughs> One thing about Calvary Chapel, we don't skip anything. We have to hit every verse, and sometimes I look and I go, oh, my gosh. So anyway, whoo, Nellie, this passage is kind of confusing. Yeah, I know. Because it seems to be an unnatural addition to the story. We have the story going on, go tell my people, and all of a sudden you get all these names hit, right? But the genealogy was here, it was placed here to identify Moses and Aaron. They needed precise identification of who they were as representatives before Egypt. Now in verses 26 through 27, which close this passage up here, it ties this section to verse 13, where Moses and Aaron were told by God to bring Israel out. And so... 26 and 27 was to explain why the genealogy was given, since it says, these are the same Moses and Aaron, and these are the ones who spoke to Pharaoh. Uh, another importance of this genealogy is to show that Moses and Aaron were established as being in the tribe of Levi. Big deal, the tribe of Levi. We see that Aaron's family is traced to his generations and his grandson, but Moses' marriage is not mentioned. Y'all remember Moses getting married. In the, in the past ones, he's not mentioned, probably because his wife, Zipporah, <coughs> was not a Hebrew. But anyway, 26 through 27, they highlight the purpose of the genealogy to focus on Moses and Aaron's Levite lineage and their authority to lead Israel out from Pharaoh's grip. It's always important to record genealogies and, and leadership roles to prove a historical authentication. It has to be authentic, proven. You've probably seen a genealogy listed for Jesus Christ before in the Bible. That was to prove that his lineage was the king and Messiah. It was, it was the way of Jewish thinking. It's like, these guys called us out. All right, who is this Moses and Aaron? Well, look at this lineage. Wow, okay, that, well, that's good, right? It's like credentials to them. So that's why it was thrown in there. Exodus 6 and 28. <coughs> and it came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt. 
that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am of uncircumcised lips, how shall Pharaoh heed me? You know, when God confronted Moses this time, we again see a similar result in Moses doubting his own ability. You ever doubted your own ability? Oh my gosh, if I told you all the times I doubted my ability. As recently as probably today. <laughs> but God deals with me, and I know he, he deals with you. And so did Moses. He was no different. But God said, I am the Lord. Sometimes God does that to me. Well, God, my nose is running. I don't know if I can get up there and talk very good. Well, God, I've got all these dozen reasons why I should not be at the pulpit. And you know what he does? He looks at me and he goes, I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord. Since when did you think it rode on you? I'm the Lord. This is my show, God says, basically. You know, I had my doubts when God called me to ministry. But a couple years ago, I went to this pastor's conference. We're going to another one here pretty soon this month. I went to a pastor's conference, and I got to hear from many different pastors about their own struggles. All the Calvary pastors in Texas and Oklahoma and all over, they all had two minutes at the pulpit to get up and say how their congregation was doing and what they needed prayer for. And they all said the same basic thing. They all said, pray for me. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I walked out of the going, oh, thank God. <laughs> It's not just me. I was thinking, man, these guys have been pastors a long time. They know what they're doing. They've got it all figured out, right? <coughs> no, never. Whose show is this? Who's, whose ministry is this? This ain't Ray Jensen Ministries. This is God's. I am the Lord. So when I start doubting myself, Moses started doubting himself. He goes, hey, Moses, I'm the Lord, not you. You never have been. You never will. I'm the Lord, right? Some people once asked Chuck Swindoll, y'all may know Chuck Swindoll, big ministry. They asked him one time if he felt the pressure that it takes to run that big ministry. He said he used to feel the pressure until he recognized it wasn't him that ran it. <laughs> Moses was not running this whole thing here in Exodus. That's why God told him up front, I am the Lord. I'm the boss. I have the authority. I have the power. You aren't the boss. You ain't God. You do not command your own destiny. Destiny. That's what I want to say. We, you know, we, we kind of get in this thing. The world teaches us, you know, get out there and do it. You know, what was it? Back to the future. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. You know, we get all like this in pride. And what does God do? He opposes the proud. He opposes the proud. You don't control and command your own stuff. God does. That's what confessing Jesus as Lord is all about. It's the acknowledgement that He's the boss and you're not. The Bible says you cannot be saved until you confess that Jesus is Lord, that He runs things, not you. With God being Lord, all we have to do is obey Him. He will make things happen. Now Romans 10.9, that if you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how you're saved, that he's the Lord. I may have told you all before, I had a friend in, uh, when I was in high school, that was in the 80s, did I date myself anyway? That was in the 80s, and there were some funky fads going around back then. I mean, spiked hair colored, I know it's still around now, but I mean, it was on in the 80s, okay? And the, just the things that people wore. And one day my friend comes to school, he had colored hair, he had some stuff going. I mean, he had all this color. He looked like a, a, a box of fluorescent crayons exploded all over him. It was something. And I said, dude, you know, I didn't judge him. It was just like, whoa, I didn't remember you like this last year. <laughs> and I said, what, 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 do you, what is this? He goes, making a statement. Making a statement. It's my statement. I'm trying to say something, man. And I said, well, what's your statement? Why don't you just say it? And he goes, no, you got to watch me to see my statement. you got to watch me. And I thought, wow, how neat. There's a lot of people that say Jesus is Lord, but that's not confessing it. That's not stating it. Stating it, you want to see Jesus Lord in my life? you got to watch me, man. you got to watch Jesus in my life. You'll see it. 
I can tell you Jesus is Lord all day, and I can fake you out and not mean it. You watch what happens in my life. You see how I start to look. You'll see that's the statement I'm making. And the only way you're going to make that statement work is if you turn it over to him and let him start doing things in your life. Then people will see it. That's confessing Jesus is Lord. That is confessing Jesus is Lord. It's not just going, Jesus is Lord, I'm saved. That, that's, that's lip service. Jesus said one time of some men, these men honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You want to declare Jesus Lord? Put it in the statement of your life. How cool is that? With God being the Lord, the boss, then all I have to do is obey Him. All I have to do is obey Him. He will make everything happen. Those big problems you have in your life, God will make them happen if Jesus becomes really your Lord. <clears throat> now Moses had to learn this, and so do we. Jesus is Lord and we're not. That takes a big load off if you ask me. Jesus is Lord and I'm not. I'm so glad that He offers to do this stuff for me because if I had to live with thinking it all depended on me, like the way I blew my life before, that would just destroy me. Jesus is Lord, we're not. That, takes, um, God, th that means God does all the heavy lifting. I know you've got things going on in your life. I've had things going on in my life. I know you're still dealing with big things in your life. Let God pick it up. It's too heavy for you. You've just burned out your muscles and broken your arms trying to pick it up yourself, and you can't. Let go of it. Let God and say, God, you're the boss now. Let Him pick it up. We just do what He tells you to. What He tells me to. Ray, I'll pick it up. I'll do it. Just do the things I tell you to do. And so when He called me out to ministry... I felt a lot like Moses. Well, I can't talk. Those of you that know me, you know I'm still scared to death of public speaking. I still battle it before I come up here. You see me pacing around back there because I'm scared. It ain't time to be scared. Well, Ray, you look pretty good doing it now. Well, yeah, there's no time for the scared right now. Now I've got to deliver a message. And you know what? You've got things in your life that you've got to do. And you're scared of it. And you won't deal with it. Because you have not made Jesus full Lord of your life, not let Him be completely Lord of your life, and before you can get over that big hurdle, you have to let it go and say, there's no time to be scared anymore. Jesus, you're the Lord. You take care of it. Just what do you want me to do? Ray, I want you to get into ministry. Well, I'm scared to talk, but okay. And here I am. Do the same thing in your life. Whatever it is. God will do the heavy lifting. Just do what He says. It leaves little room for doubt when all we have to do is obey. Little room for doubt. All that stuff you're doubting right now. You right now. Right now, just think right now. Your situation. I'm going to take this whole Moses thing and we're going to put it on ourselves. Think about that big thing you're contending with. Whatever it is. Some of you I know. Some of you I don't know. Give it to God. Tonight, give it to God. It's time to let go of it. You've tried to do it yourself too long, and it hadn't worked. It's time to let go. And what you never could do, he will do, if you'll let him have it. I pray that you do that. Can we go ahead and uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew, Matthew and uh, Tommy, there's some communion stuff back here. If y'all can get that and start passing it out, and uh, we're going to do communion now. I'm trying to encourage you that there are things in your life that can be dealt with if you'll let the Lord have it. I'm trying to encourage you that life can be filled with joy in God. I'm also trying to tell you who the real Lord is because there's a fake one out there that the world is believing in that cannot completely heal, that cannot completely deliver. He cannot completely provide. And maybe you've been following that God and you're wondering why can't God do these things because you're not following the true Lord. And so as we get ready to have communion tonight, we're going to remember the Lord who died for our sins, that made the way for us to be saved, 
Something that you could not do by yourself. Something that you could not ever do because you can't afford it. You know, to realize that what Jesus paid for in one day on the cross would have taken you and I an eternity to pay for ourselves. There's no way you could have ever paid your own salvation. And so he has asked us to do this communion to remember him. Is there more cups? Is there more? Okay, okay, maybe he has another one. Okay. And I'm just thankful. I'm just thankful that we serve a God that has provided everything. In this communion, we're going to take this uh, cracker and this uh, grape juice that's symbolic of his blood and his body. Something that he provided that I could not. And the reason he did it is because he loves you and he cares about you. There was a real paradox in the fact that we failed, we messed up, we sinned, and therefore by God's justice we had to be condemned. When somebody commits a crime, he has to be punished. But God does not want you to be punished for all eternity. And even though we deserve it, What he did was he sent his own son, Jesus Christ, which was God in in flesh, to die on the cross in your place. To take the wrath you were supposed to take, to take the punishment that you were supposed to get, that I was supposed to get, so that we can be free. Coming to belief in Jesus, declaring him as Lord, means that you're forgiven. You repent of your sins and leave that old life behind. You come to Jesus Christ. Then all of the penalty that sat on you, all the things that you deserve for the sins that you've committed, leaves. And it goes 2,000 years ago to the cross like a time warp. And it lands on Jesus Christ. That's why the crucifixion was so bad. That's why it was so hideous and so terrible because it was the sin of the whole world mine and yours that went to him so that we could be saved and Luke 22 says when the hour had come he sat down and the twelve apostles with him and he said to them with fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I say to you I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're doing this to remember what the Lord Jesus did for us. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. You take this cup. Father God, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. Lord God, if there is one person, if there is even one person in here tonight, who just realized I have been doing things my way and I haven't trusted in you to bring me out of my oppression just like you did for the Israelites. Lord, if they just realized I need Jesus Christ to fix my life, show them grace, Father. Draw them to your Son. Lord, in the Gospel, I just want to state it just so I can say I said it again. Lord, if there's just even one person here tonight, they're just now getting this. Lord God, 
we all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of you and we'll never amount up, we'll never be worthy. But you saved us because you loved us. You saved a bunch of sinful people that ran the wrong way. We spit in your face, we slapped you, we insult you. And for some reason you still love us enough to have died for us so that we don't have to be condemned. Lord, I cannot imagine the love you have. Lord, I pray for anyone who has just now discovered this. Show them that Jesus is the way of salvation and that they repent of their old life. They give up doing things their own way and they hand it over to you because you are capable. You said, I will save you. And so, Lord, as God, you have to fulfill your promises or else you can't be God. You are God and you are able and you do fulfill what you promise. And so, Lord, I just want to make sure everybody understands one more time. We are all condemned without you. Lord, bring your people to salvation. Bring your people to repentance, to let go of the old life and let it go to Jesus Christ. Have them now confess, not just by merely stating it, but you know what? Now I am no longer the boss of my own life. I now stop doing things my way. Lord Jesus, take over. Lord Jesus, do the things I never could do. Lord, fix the problems in my life. Lord, show me righteousness and show me how to turn from doing the wrong way. Give me guidance and give me strength. And Lord, open the doors. I just want to be willing to obey whatever you tell me to do. Lord, I pray tonight is a new night for someone here that has given their life to Jesus Christ. Lord, I can't talk. Lord, I'm not eloquent. I'm, the not, I'm not the fanciest pastor they've ever heard. I'm not the slickest with words, but I, Lord, I know enough to tell them that Jesus Christ made the way and that they need to be saved, that that false Jesus out there is not going to help them. Save your people tonight, Lord God. Save your people tonight, Lord God. Bring your people. Bring your people. Lord, we have taken communion to remember you, to thank you for what you've done for us and that what we could not do for ourselves, you paid our way because we're broke. And now, Lord, I don't have to be eternally condemned in a literal place called hell, as scary as it is. And the world don't like to hear that word, Lord God. They don't like anybody to talk about hell, but it's there. And Lord, for someone to not believe that it's there, they're deceived. They have to know what happens to those who will not accept your way. And Lord, this isn't just about dodging hell, it's about gaining Jesus. It's about living in righteousness and having fun with life, real joy. I ask you, Lord God, you've changed somebody's life tonight. Thank you again, I can't thank you enough. Lord, I thank you a dozen times tonight. I can't thank you enough for what you've done for us. You saved us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. And for whoever you may have saved tonight, Lord God, I pray for that person in Jesus' name. Amen.